All right. This is fabulous. Jill and Mary, thank you again. I know this was super last minute, a little bit to get the planning, but you know, with CP and with everything that's happening right now with COVID, we are doing what we can to still really get engaged with our community and have plenty of outlets, creative outlets to get in touch with folks out there. So this is one of them. Um, this is not, yeah, this is not the first kind of Zoom club we hosted this, the, this past coming week. MJ, who will be joining us shortly here, hosted um, a voter impression, a Zoom club that talked about uh, a documentary film called Suppressed. We had our first trivia night this past week. Um, and this one itself is one of three discussions that we're going to have with you. So I'm excited to kind of host my own. I recently had a baby, so I've been kind of out of the loop. Congratulations. But I want to get, thank you. I want to get engaged. I want to get, I want to see faces. I want to get some great minds to still continue the effort and really still make it feel like you know covid hasn't stopped us so there's a lot of things right now where efforts are stalled um, businesses are closing and common purpose is just thinking of ways to still get through this and it hasn't stopped us all we're trying to do is find a different way and with our staff and the creativity of the 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 leaders in our organization have definitely come up with some really, really fun ways to still get engaged, but also include other people in the fold. So aside from all of that, this is one of the platforms we're going to use. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And the discussion for this one is the mini series, Mrs. America. So I'm 38 years old. I was born and raised in the Philippines. So I, have n I don't have a long history of political knowledge or political movements um, that's at all equivalent to both you and Mary. So I need to also get schooled in this. So please, like I'm a sponge for all of this. I am quite intrigued um, with the show. I also, you know, when I saw the trailer, I had a lot of light bulbs going, you know, going off. I want to dive deep into the world that we're in. I all, you know, I always wanted to see where I can make an impact. Um, you know, as many others out there in the CP community and uh, started to really learn about the ERA and what, you know, what women had to do in the movement to ratify it. Um, the show features five women, uh, Phyllis Schlafly, Schlafly, Gloria Steinman, Betty, is it Frieden? Frieden. Frieden, uh, Shirley yeah. Chisholm, is it Bella? How do you Bella, say, say Bella? Bella Abzub. Okay, I will, and then you, the the famous Jill Ruckel's house. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> um, so for all of you out there who is joining us, you know, uh, you know, welcome her and welcome CP. And if you can somewhere out there, just wave to the camera to just say hello and to welcome our special guest here. Um, so this particular, uh, you know, this, this discussion really talks about episode one through three. And we try to timeline it so we can make the most out of your time, but also give viewers time to watch the episodes. So whether or not you've watched the episodes, there's still a lot of information and dialogue and topics that's still really relevant today. And for the viewers out there, um, probably start to get a little bit of a, you know, a familiarity of what's really happening now, maybe some parallels of what's happening now um, with, uh, um, you know, with what's happening currently in our political landscape. So, you know, I want to go, I just want to dive in. I want to just maximize your time. So first of all, Andreas, did they reach out to you to see and ask permission at all if you're we're gonna if you're willing to do it still. Marcy, you're Marcy, kind of you're breaking, breaking up, up maybe. Oh, sorry. Did uh, you did they did anybody at all ask uh reach out to you and ask you for your cooperation no. for the film? No. No. I've, I've not talked to anybody. And otherwise I would have been portrayed as Joan of Arc. I don't know what they have in mind, but I haven't talked to anybody, so I'm as eager as all of you are to follow the progress of this. And I've been, I've seen the first three episodes. Okay. And I think that's, I think they're doing pretty well. Oh, in okay. portraying the women and um, the passions and the tensions that arose during um, the both political parties as they approached uh, the conventions 
and yeah, we can talk about that. But I think based on the first three episodes, it's going very well. I may just skip the one that's about the Republican convention. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, no worries. Um, and so, you know, are you pleased with Elizabeth Banks playing you in the show? Um, sure, I think <laughs> she's had a, I mean, she is portraying me so far as an amused bystander <laughs> representing the Republican Party during the formation of the Women's Political Caucus in 1971, which um, is probably true. The, the caucus was formed, um, uh, just a moment of history, in 1970, mm -hmm. the Congress failed to pass an ERA. And it was a very galvanizing moment. And many women uh, who, had, who had worked for it, crafted the language, were careful about uh, politics, got really angry about that. And so the National Women's Political Caucus was formed with the idea that if we got more women elected to office, that's the, that's the goal of the caucus, mm -hmm. to eventually to elect more women in both parties to serve at state level, local level, national level, and be part of the dialogue and represent the lives and experiences of women in what was then the 20th century because we felt that at that moment, the men who'd been elected, there were very few women in Congress and no women mayors and virtually no women serving in public office, proportionally very unequal. That if more women did, things like the Equal Rights Amendment would be taken seriously and would be passed. So the caucus was formed to be bipartisan and the goal was to get more women nominated and elected and supported, and a broader group of women educated about the importance of more participation in the political process. So that was that. And, right. and I, I think uh, what they've shown so far about the formation of the, of the caucus in 71, its first convention, and uh, the conversations that took place, predominantly represented by Democrat women and because they were in the Congress uh, in some numbers and, you know, definitely Bella, Gloria, Betty, a great number of those women that you've come to know in the program are all Democratic women. So uh, I was representing the Republican Party, so we were bipartisan in the caucus. I was working then in the White House uh, for Ann Armstrong. I was a speechwriter for Ann Armstrong. And um, my husband was working in the uh, political party. He was a Republican for life, and he was in the administration of Richard Nixon. Um, he went in in the Justice Department, but he was at that moment of the caucus being formed, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, the first head. Okay, I'll stop for a while. No, you're good. You're good. This is I'm I'm soaking it all in. So let me get this straight. It's been almost a hundred years since the introduction of the ERA. Is that like accurate? That's right. The first amendment, the first time there was any mention of women in the Constitution of the United States. No mistake, because the founders knew who they were including when they wrote the Constitution, and it wasn't minorities and it wasn't women, was uh, the right to vote, the 19th Amendment, which was passed in 1920. And it specifically guaranteed the right to vote to both sexes. The right to vote cannot be denied on account of sex. The language is very similar to the language of the ERA. And that was not a mistake. It was meant to reflect the language that had passed to make it possible for women to vote. But after that amendment, which gave that specific right, women were not given any specific rights in the Constitution and in the social fabric and in laws and customs in the country. 
women definitely were not first class citizens. So that was the idea behind the ERA. And that that struggle and that effort and that fight continues. And you know, when 20 years after the passage of women's right to vote, we're still trying to get another mention of women in the Constitution so that we'll never have to be mentioned again. It, women will be protected. Discrimination will not be allowed in legal form on the basis of sex. Which kind of leads me to my first question. So the series opens up with Phyllis uh, kind of walking a catwalk um, in the beginning of the episode one. And it looks like she is doing a pageant of some sort. Um, and it looks like a, a re-election campaign or a re-election or just a, a, a re-election bid of some sort to raise funds. And she's kind of walking the catwalk, um, strutting her stuff. And then she goes back into you know, the, the dressing room. So for, for the viewers out there who have not seen this, I promise there, were not, there won't be a lot of spoilers. I still really encourage you to go and watch it. It's a, it's a fantastic film. Um, I'm enjoying every minute of it. Um, and so, you know, she is, you know, uh, so what the question I want to ask is, do you feel that there's um, the, the way that the film is, or the series is portraying the women, is it pretty accurate? Portrays Phyllis in particular? Yes. Or, yes. Um, yeah, just a note about Phyllis. Phyllis Schlafly was not raised in a wealthy background. Her, her father was struggled all his life to hold a job as mo her mother helped support her. Phyllis Lafley is a very bright woman and she was also extremely ambitious and she got her, married um, a lawyer and a fellow from a prominent family in Alton, Illinois and she discovered that she loved politics. Mm. She was primarily got interested because her husband was writing a paper for the Bar Association on the communist threat. So she became very anti-communist, very interested in the national defense against communism. She always thought the threat was greater outside than inside. That was a source of debate at one time historically. She was really smart and she wanted very much to be elected. She ran for the House of Representatives in Illinois and, and was not elected. Later on, 10 years later, she ran for the Illinois legislature and was not elected. And she also ran to be head of the Republican Party Organization for Women and was not elected. So she had ambition and she saw that there were, was a place for women in the Republican Party. I have, I'm being fair to Phyllis because I don't want her, your generation probably sees her maybe two dimensionally and she was a woman like we are. She went to University of Washington, St. Louis. She, she was a beauty queen. She participated in beauty pageants. That was a way to get people looking at her and have herself be recognized at a certain stage. But later on, she became a serious academic. She got a BA from University of Washington in St. Louis. She got a master's degree a year later. Late in the 70s, after all this were historical part we're going to talk about, she got her law degree. So she was smart as a whip and very opportunistic. And she was, as, as I'll show you, primarily interested in communism, the Defense Department, Mm -hmm. How many bombers did we have? How many aircraft carriers? She had those statistics down. And really it was women in her hometown in Illinois where she had groups organizing to follow politics. She was a great organizer. They mentioned to her the Equal Rights Amendment and what they'd been hearing about it. And she began to see that they were much more, the women were much more interested in that issue because they were afraid it would force equality on them, which mm -hmm. seemed like Phyllis convinced them eventually it was going to take away their rights. Mm -hmm. Phyllis started an organization called STOP ERA and STOP standard, stood for Stop Taking Our Privileges. 
she helped led the women who followed her to understand that the ER would, would take away this privileged life they were leaving, leading and they would be forced to work. Husbands would no longer be forced to support their wives. In real life, every family makes its own arrangement, but there were lots of women working men, not making anything like what men made. But middle class, upper economic class women were not working. And the threat of having to leave the home and go work was not something they wanted to stare in the face. These women were afraid to be with equal rights, they would have to be drafted just like men. There was no draft at the moment, but we know it could be instituted anytime. They feared women would be drafted, that women might have to go into combat, who would take care of the children. So when Phyllis heard that that's what the women cared about, she began to see that that was a great wedge issue for her political ambition. So we see her being portrayed at that stage where she wakes up to the possibility of the issue. And then she expands and I think misrepresents and frightens women during the anti-ERA movement. But up to that point, don't uh, for a moment think she didn't have struggles of her own, discrimination of her own. She showed a wonderful, I mean, if Phyllis were born right now, she would no doubt be president of a university or a CEO by the time she was 50. Maybe she'd have that ambition. But the only way to express it back then was in a women's organization on women's issues. And, and the writing did really well in terms of kind of showing some of that crack, right? Because she has a friend who is like a dear friend to her that we see in multiple scenes in episode one, where, uh, you know, she tells her friend that like her kid, she's like a second mother to her children, but this person, her friend is not, I can't think of the name right now, but it's just, you know, she's unwed. She hasn't, she doesn't have kids of her own. So when they were, uh, when they were planning the mother daughter or were they're planning another uh, event where this friend had attended, she spoke about um, exactly that, about what the ERA is, is going to do to the household. And it zooms in on the friend because it, it she kind of attacks in a way uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the childless, uh, non-married women, and it zooms in on her friend, and you can see, like, her friend just kind of starting to question maybe the value of their friendship, and so the, 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 this, you know, the, the writers or producers do, or directors do a really good job of honing in on that, and I'm sure that moving into the next set of episodes, there's going to be a lot more cracks and a lot more um, opening of doors to a different side of her, probably, I'm assuming, um, and it looks like her episode features, um, you know, uh, a woman. Uh, so your episode is coming up. I think it's like episode five or six. Um, do you, when you look at, when you look at Elizabeth Banks and the way she is um, portraying you, are you proud or are you critiquing in a way? <laughs> I mean, you see a group photograph that includes your picture. Aren't you critiquing the face you had on that day? Yes, we of all course. critique ourselves all the time. So I'm looking at myself in this gathering of the Women's Political Caucus. And I don't know about the face. She's certainly much prettier than I am. But my, my posture and my interventions in the conversations probably are about right because that forming was... I mean, the, the loud Democrats and the women who had some publicity of their own, like Betty Friedan, who had written The Feminine Mystique and had quite uh, a following and, and fame of her own, was a noisy woman and Gloria was very well known. So they were speaking mostly from the Democrat point of view and I was representing Republicans and I wasn't going to get into their troubles because the Democrats had a lot of inter-party fighting. Um, some personal, but mostly about issues. And, you know, the Republican Party at that moment was kind of allowing me to do what I wanted uh, in the White House and try to get language that I wanted in the party platform. So 
I, I pushed our issues in the caucus, but mostly I see myself sitting there looking wryly amused, and that's probably correct at that point. Yeah. I don't awesome. And then, so Mary, I want to, Mary, I want to ask, like when you're seeing the, the scenes of mom, what's your reaction? Like when you look at the screen and you see mom in the scene, what's your reaction? Yeah, I'm, I'm so proud. And um, just to think, I remember, you know, I was young at that point, too young. I wish I'd been older and could have gone with mom to these meetings, but I'm really proud. And I also recognize mom because she is always, you know, as you just heard mom, you describing Phyllis, you have so much empathy for people in all walks of life and there's so much diversity in even something like a women's movement and even something like you know the Ms. Magazine staff group there's so much diversity of peoples and opinions so mom's always trying to find the common ground like our common purpose team so yeah it's very fun to see her and um and then we've been doing a lot of color commentary debriefs like you're getting her to do now Larcy so it's fun to hear the backstory of who was that and was that Gary Hart at that convention and who who was Gloria's boyfriend and all that stuff which is very fun too oh that's actually well we may get we may dive into that later then well <laughs> we we do have a question on here but I, before I get to that question um you know the in in one of the episodes it shows uh a, 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 like a quick kind of passing between you and Phyllis, where uh, Phyllis is just getting out of, um, of the meeting, uh, talking about, uh, you know, this, this possibility of her, um, you know, talking about the, I think it was the environmental act. Um, and then in, in the scene, it, it talks about, or she is like, really, like you said, she's, she's smart, she's um, articulate, and she is just, you know, kind of, you know, just Kind of spitting knowledge about her knowledge of even the ERA, and she just gets kind of washed over by the men, and they ask her to go get a pen to go, you know, to go write the notes. Is that right? Fascinating. Oh my gosh! And and like I can feel like I can feel the boil in the in the veins kind of moment, you know, right. in that. Like Lacey, she took it. Yes, took it, and yes. went back because first of all, she wanted to be in the group, and she. Like, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but women historically have taken it. We know how to get along in the strata we've been given by doing what we're supposed to do and taking it. And that's what she was doing, but they made it very clear she knew exactly what had happened to her. She was getting marginalized in Washington, D.C., and she began to see that her power would lie back in Illinois at a, in a grassroots movement of women. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so right after that meeting, she comes out, and then that was kind of the first introduction of your character. Now, is that true to fact that that was like one of the very few first instances that you interacted with in life? No, no, I didn't recognize, <laughs> I didn't recognize that episode. Oh, okay, okay. So then tell me, tell me when was the first time you actually engaged with her and had a conversation with her? Um, I think I had a conversation with Phyllis probably in Illinois during the, all the activity in Springfield trying to get the ERA ratified by the Illinois uh, delegation and House of Representatives in their Senate and it was a really tumultuous few days in, in uh, Springfield, and I met her then. And I always felt, you know, that Phyllis was so smart that she surely knew that some of the things she was saying were, if not technically inaccurate, they were inflammatory. They were meant to take a, a piece of information that could be could, the future could play out one way or another and making it as frightening as possible to women for her own goals. And of course, that's a political tactic, just not one I've ever, I just honestly, in the end, can hardly understand how people can allow themselves because I believe that she knew that that was inaccurate. 
So I thought, how can somebody so smart willingly say something that they know is not true? But she certainly rebuffed me every time I looked for that common ground. Mm, interesting. So let's, if the women were alive today, what, how do you feel would be kind of the approach that they would be doing to still push this movement along? And it's a two part question. How can the rest of us support in that movement? Uh, well, the women's movement is kind of interesting because although the ERA did not get passed, I think I said sort of simplistically once to Phyllis, you know, in the end, these ideas are going to prevail. This is the march of progress. It's not without interruption and setback, but it is a march towards a more humanistic, a more equal society. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's what America has intended, even though we've not always been good at doing it. So I felt that in the end, our side was going to prevail, but it would take a lot longer than we wanted. So yes, those things that Here's a wonderful thing. Phyllis tried to frighten women that they would be forced to become equal and therefore men would stop giving them their privileges, which also a part of the privilege was that congressman saying to Phyllis Schlafly, would you mind taking notes? That was part of the privilege, the protection that men were giving. That's, so women becoming equal sounded frightening because Phil's convinced everyone something would be taken away. You wouldn't have the support of men underneath you, many women unmarried, many women divorced, with even without that kind of support. But in fact, most marriages are have become much more um, based on human beliefs than sexual assignment of roles. We're not perfect on that, but we certainly are moving toward it. Um, the, the issues that we fought for have, many of them are part of everyday life now. And if Gloria and Phyllis and Betty were here looking back at the progress that's been made, they would be amazed. At the moment, that it was happening, it looked like what a fight for something that's so reasonable. Felt that way to me too. But let's not underestimate Schlafly. She began to play on a really, I feel, unfortunate part of human nature and that was embedded in the Republican Party eventually, which was anti-immigration, anti, -immigration, anti gay rights, anti, I mean, part of what Phyllis would say would, this ERA would allow marriage of gay people. She campaigned very hard on that. And that was frightening to people back then. And abortion was frightening to people back then. And she picked up all these issues. And they're now, we've, we've had to fight for them as a society, but they're now part of the way Americans expect to be able to be allowed to live their lives. I always thought the ERA should be part of the Bill of Rights. It guarantees a right, which is a right to be treated equally under the law. So it, it never made sense to me that Republicans fought it so hard eventually. But in 1972, they did not. In 1972, the Republican Party, in its platform, endorsed the hasty passage of the ERA. And there is language in that platform. I was there, so I know it was there. We were part of working for that, to work towards equality of treatment for women, better pay for women, more women in positions of power and authority. That's part of the Republican platform in 1972 definitely began to change for the party. And uh, the Republican Party now 
is um, a different place than I felt it was when I was growing up and as late as 1972. But those women would be, I'm sure they would still be active because you could see it in all of them like it was in Phyllis. Uh, desire to be in the middle of things and the desire to be moving and shaping and having people listening to them. So they would all have run for office except for Gloria, who was not that kind of person. But they were, you know, they were all friends of mine and I came to understand them and I was very fond of all of them. And sometimes it was so hard to um, forgive Betty because Betty was really rude. But I, in my interpretation, that was based on who she was, her sense of insecurity and a need to be in the middle of things being paid attention to. Awesome, thank you. Marcy, so, it, oh, yes. Questions. Did you did you know the questions in the Q&A? There's a bunch yes. of really good ones. Yep. Oh. Yep. I'm not seeing them. Do you see them, Lacey? Larcy's on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Larcy. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, oh, okay. So I'm just going to go. So we have a question from Donna. Donna Stringer says, how does Jill feel about the current endeavor to complete the ERA process versus starting fresh? Uh, that is a really good question. Um, I don't, I think it's fine to keep talking about it and raising it and educating it, but, uh, hopefully nobody's going to bring it to the floor of either house till after the election. Mm. As I don't think there would be much chance of any progress on that score until, um, after the defeat of this president, um, uh, which, I might as well tell you I hope for. And he has such control of the Republicans in the Senate. I don't think that issue would have any chance of being brought to the floor by McConnell or passing. But in a new era, um, it may come up again. It ran through its, it was given a timetable. Most, most amendments are not given a timetable for ratification. It's kind of open-ended. And recently one was ratified for, that was almost a hundred years old. It was pro forma by that time, but it was ratified. So, but the ERA had a timetable and that ran out and it was given a five-year extension and that ran out in 1982. So the question is, should we start over? Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can answer that question until you've done a really good analysis of the way the state houses in all 50 states look after the election in November. I think, I mean, I think there are many, many states who've passed their own ERAs. And hopefully those states would do that again for, a, for an amendment to the constitution. But, um, I'm, I'm all for getting it into the Constitution. The question is the mechanism and maybe starting over is the best thing or maybe there's another way. But I just advise against doing anything till after November. Mm, that's a good, that's, that's good. Because, um, you know, we have a lot of young women in CP and we're starting to reach out to more rising leaders out there. So we're probably going to see in our lifetime uh, more effort and more pushes, you know, for the ERA out there. And so, you know, with that in mind, you know, what, what efforts do you feel? Ivy Strickland wanted to know, you know, um, what young women can do now to help further women's equality, especially in the workplace. Right. Well, um, you know, I think the, the issue of equal pay is still very much alive. When I was first talking about this when women were first talking about this and my involvement was women were making just barely over 50 percent of what men made on an average salary and women doing the same work that men did were not paid anything close and women were segregated to certain kinds of jobs this was in the 70s that sounds ridiculous to us now because although pay is still not on a parity 
it's moving that direction. So it's 80% or close to that now. But I'm, I, I think I'd suggest that you be part of um, a political party that tries to get women elected, that our voices in city councils, county councils, state legislatures, House of Representatives and the Senate are very, very important when these discussions come up. So of course, women in the workplace would be given the protections that men were given if the ERA were in place. And in practice, that, that happens, or at least I like to think so. I think women can speak for themselves on that, on those issues. But issues that involve economics, equal pay, equal opportunity for all jobs, uh, equal health protections. I mean, I think states are very harsh now about allowing abortions to be performed in many states. And I understand the feeling that many people have about that issue, but uh, it is the law of the land that some states have found ways to reduce it to getting around the law and uh, making it unavailable in their states. And I think that's a terrible misinterpretation of what was intended by um, the Supreme Court when it passed the Roe v. Wade. So that is a fight worth, worth having because it's really a basic health question for women. And, you know, in many places, planned parenting for women is not easily available. It, it just tickles me that the Congress has included Viagra for men among the prescription drugs that they'll pay for. But women have trouble getting prenatal care and, and the pill and any kind of birth control. That's not... That's not something that Congress has included in their um, health plans. So I mean, those are inequalities that if there were more women's voices in the decision-making bodies would not be possible, but they are now. So talking about those issues and the unfairness of it and the reasonableness of, uh, I have great faith that continuing to raise the issues and represent them. I just don't want to give people who oppose these issues easy targets. And the easy targets are, in my mind, noisy demonstrations that characterize the other side almost in a mirror image of what they're saying about us. Not the same thing, but without any understanding of what they're doing, of why they're motivated. I'm not, I'm not much for noisy demonstrations and characterizing your enemies as villainous and demons. So I'd be, I encourage young women, oh, I have such faith in your generation and the one behind you, Larcy and the one behind you. They're just not gonna put up with this stuff. But it, it moves slowly, but you can fight in your own state for things that you know are unfair. And I have a lot of confidence that we've now moved to a better understanding of these issues as a country. Those are great words. Thank you so much. And I know CP and Common Purpose, this is a destination for those same exact principles and values. And so for the women out there, young women who are watching this, um, you know, we, we want to include you. We want to support you. Sun Purpose has over half of our staff members who are women and we're rising leaders. And, you know, we believe in these same principles and values and destin and, and CP is a destination for you to get involved in something. So, you know, I definitely encourage you to explore a lot of that out there. Um, and also we'll welcome you um, in the effort in the site as Jill was saying, is we just, we have work to do and we want it, we need to support each other to, to continue on this fight and this endeavor. So on to the next question from Sherry Wilson. What do you think about Virginia becoming the 36th state to ratify? 
Yes, good for yeah. Virginia. <laughs> good for Virginia. So now it's if they're allowed if we're allowed to count, we're at 36 out of 38, which we need. And uh, all I can say is good for Virginia. And it would be nice if any other states followed through and we got to 38 and then the question would go to the Supreme Court about whether you can continue to add on states to the necessary three-fifths after a time limit has been exceeded because the time limit is not really part of the wording of the Constitution. It was added on later of the constitutional amendment. And I think we have some legal grounds to argue that the time limit should not have applied, historically wouldn't have applied. It's worth making the argument uh, for that because it'll take quite an effort to go state by state again. But I'm sure if we do end up doing it state by state, it will pass this time. I just believe that. So good for Virginia. Yes, good for Virginia. Um, now we just got to get everybody, all the other states to rally behind it, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> so Susan, is it Ortwine, has a question for Mary. When did you fully understand the impact your mom had in the fight for women's equality? And do you remember any of the events that she spurred you on to be an activist for women? Oh, that's great. Hi, Susan. Uh, yes, I, I have early memories. Um, so probably, you know, when I was pretty young, mom was always, mom and dad, we grew up in this household where mom and dad were always out in, in politics, in, in the public eye. Um, and just, you know, in their quiet, um, very sort of thoughtful and inclusive way, like you've been hearing mom now, trying to make a difference. So I do remember very specifically thinking about, um, going to, uh, uh, I think it was a, maybe a, it was a march of some kind, mom, probably we weren't making too much noise, anti-noise for the other side um, in, a, in a mean way, like you were saying, but I remember you taking, so there's five kids in our family, for those of you who don't know, and I remember mom taking us to a march somewhere down on the Washington Mall, and we were pretty little, and there were five of us under seven. I'm sure we weren't quite that little, but maybe I was 10. Um, and just feeling the energy in the crowd and the enthusiasm, and everybody had a real positive spirit. I just remember being really excited by that. And I, Mom, you might remember what that was, what that march was, but uh, and then there was just lots of discussion at the dinner table. So we would talk about, you know, our soccer practice or our homework, but also what was happening in Washington at the time. And that was also just got me hooked completely from a young age. So mom, I don't know if you remember what March that was, but I definitely have a, a very clear feeling of making sure that none of us got lost in the crowd. But <laughs> yeah. I, I don't remember which March that was, sweetie, because it was a time of great activism for women in the early 70s, which is, tracks the time that we were in the government and active. And you're right about the feeling. I mean, I would go to women's conventions and be part of these marches for women's rights or the Equal Rights Amendment. And it it was so, it just made you feel you were part of something that mattered. The women were all supporting one another and on the same track. And you just could hardly imagine when you came home that one single person in the whole country thought differently than you did. As reality soon interceded, but it was a wonderful thing to be part of a civil rights march or a women's rights march. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's it's funny that, you know, now that I have we have two boys in the family and we now have our baby girl. And before COVID had hit, we, you know, Common Purpose had all these plans to travel, to mobilize our volunteers, to go knock on doors. And I had this plan that she will be strapped on a baby carrier with me knocking doors. And I still really see that um, come to fruition at some point in the future. And 
holding her hand to some of these with her own little signs. So I, you know, I really admire that, you know, that interaction between the two of you that you still can drag your kids to these things and eventually they get it and it resonates. So thank you. <laughs> um, here's a fun question from MJ. Did the, did the stop um, ERA group really bring bread to to uh, there's a senior they actually brought what was it bread absolutely. makers from bread winners <laughs> absolutely they certainly did it was a very good tactic it's completely you know a lot of men didn't really care they kind of wanted the women to go away because they were worried about other things and the vietnam war was going on and there were lots of other things they were so the fact that they had to think about the era and women were standing in the hallways chanting they hardly knew what to do. So if they arrived at their desk and there was bread saying, a little bread from a breadwinner, they thought, oh yes, these are my women. <laughs> so yes, it was very effective. They did it all the time when the legislature was getting ready to vote. And I remember working in Arizona when the vote was coming up and, um, we had rallies and we were ready and we went to the state house in phoenix and they i think it was in phoenix and they were there and we were there but they had gotten to all the desks and left a little note with a little heart and a little i think it was candy but it might have been a cookie in a heart shape talking about we love you and you have our hearts and we're counting on you and all those wonderful things. So it was a, it was a good tactic. It was made it made us all think, ooh, why didn't we think of something? Yeah, some people can get won over by food. I, I probably <laughs> have had a few occasions where somebody would put something in front of me and I'm just savoring it and just kind of nodding away kind of thing. Um, <laughs> all right, we have about two more questions I'd love to get to. We're gonna wrap this up. I'm having a lot of fun really gaining a lot of knowledge in this and really getting more motivated to continue on this work. Um, the next one is from Sherry Wilson. I'd love to hear more about what you think about the possibility of passing the ERA today and about the lack of Republican women running for office. Right, well, um, I, th I believe that the ERA will be added to the Constitution at some point. I'm not going to put a timetable on it, and, and I have already said, I think it depends a lot on the election in November, because first of all, I don't think it would ever be brought to the floor now with this Senate, and um, and if it did, it would be brought to the floor to be defeated, so we, we don't want that to happen. But I think it will be eventually, and I think it, in the meantime, we should all be talking about it and why it's still relevant and it still offers uh, the whole spectrum of activity in a country, economic, psychological, how important it is. So that's one thing we can do. And uh, why are there not more Republican women running? I don't know. It, it, it may be a legacy, but there are a lot of Republican women running. And many of the w Republican women running have opinions different than mine, but I know the effort involved in running and I don't discount that experience for other women uh, and they have found a way to get elected. And so you have to take your hat off to that because it's a terrible fight. Um, but I think in, in in time, there will be more Republican. The party, I hope, will become a slightly different party when this administration is out of office. It has a history of moderation with a conservative wing. And really, I think Phyllis had a great deal to do with pushing the party to the far right. So that's good or bad, depending on your point of view. From my point of view, it's impeded many of the things that could be beneficial to women. But the party is now much more to the right, controlled by th that philosophy than it was when I was growing up. And I think there are lots of people now who are Republicans who yearn for 
a different party that you could belong to with your head up um, because it represented our country with variations to the right, Democrat party with variations to the left. Both parties swing to their extremes, but they passed the center coming back and forth. So I hope that will happen again with the Republican party. I know there are Republican representatives and senators that I admire. So hopefully in time, that will become the voice of the party again. It just cannot be now, unfortunately. And uh, Larcy, do you see a question in front of you with the name Ivy on it? I did. It was it was already asked earlier. Yeah, you answered it, Mom. It was from Strickland. Yeah. Okay, Ivy. I just wanted to be sure I answered your question. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we have another question from uh, it says Jennifer Daves, and it kind of it, it's it's along the same topics about how there isn't much uh, women representing um, the Republican Party. This one says, "I'm interested in your opinion about how few elected Republicans, including Republican women, are willing to stand up for women's rights, including access to family planning and abortion. Will the middle ground ever come back?" Larson, I missed, I missed the last part of that, sweetie. Oh, will, will a middle ground ever come back? Right. Well, I pray for that. <laughs> I believe that it will because I think our country is a center right, center left, but predominantly center. There, there's lots of criticism of the center as being wishy-washy and not committed, but that's the, not the way I see our country. You know, I, I'm upset when I see these demonstrations like the one in Michigan in which people who I'm sure are going to vote probably, maybe, they want the country open back up again. They want their state open back up again. But they're expressing an opinion that's perfectly valid. But they're wearing combat uniforms and carrying weapons you can express your opinion in this country without doing that. What is that about? So that kind of extremism exists in our society on both sides, but I'm hoping there will be moments of a great coming together where the majority of Americans will be happy to find leaders who represent uh, moderation, intelligence, progression towards a greater humanity, a more equal society for everybody. And you, you don't need to carry a weapon to express your opinion that's available to everybody. That's so true. And many of us are very, very determined to get those elected leaders into the right position so that we wouldn't have to see the crazy, you know, photos that we're seeing right now with, you know, armed individuals thinking that that's the right way to, you know, to, you know, to exercise the free speech. I know I said we had two questions, but I love the engagement from everybody out there. And actually two more last questions that we have only minutes left. Can we answer them here? Can we stretch it five more minutes? Oh, well, sure, I can. Okay. All right. So we have two questions from, or the two questions are from Julie and from a Stephanie. Julie says, Jill, thank you for all of your acti activism over the years. On behalf of women and others, I echo that. Do you still consider yourself an old school Republican or do you now consider yourself a Democrat? Do you have any suggestions to bring both parties back to meetings, to meeting across the aisle? Uh, you know, I, I, yes, I think that searching for common ground goes on all the time. There just, there need to be representatives at all levels of our government that are willing to do that. So electing extreme, extremists to the right or extremists to the left will not be looking for compromise. And this virus that the country is so aware of right now is kind of shaking everybody to the roots. It's 
Pollyannish to imagine that we will come back to the all for one and one for all that we talk about now. We recognize the important part every citizen is playing in this drama and how dependent we are. And hopefully we won't forget that when we go to the polls or elect representatives, that what we want is an America that is joined up for common cause that will lead to a more equal and and just, and I'm not talking about socialism or equal finish line for everybody. That just is a is hardly possible. But the equal application of the laws to all Americans, fairness, and a concern for some of the issues that have been highlighted during the course of this virus, the inequalities economically, in health care, you know the issues and they'll be part of the campaign. Um, and, and do I think the Republic, what am I, a Republican or a Democrat? Well, I won't, vote, I won't vote for this Republican president, that's for sure. But I may once again consider myself a Republican as we move into the future of the party. Right now, I'm not voting for this guy. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> so last one, Stephanie says, did the members of the caucus ever have a moment later in life, perhaps, where they realized while the ERA did not get ratified, their work made huge impact on bringing the importance of valuing women to light? And this is Stephanie Garriga. Hello in Jackson, Mississippi. Hi, Stephanie. Wow, hi. <laughs> That's impressive. Thank you for Stephanie, joining, Stephanie. Stephanie is my niece in Jackson, Mississippi. Oh. Um, the question was, have Republican women recognized? Have the, did the members of the caucus ever have a moment to, to really realize, um, even though the ERA did not get ratified, the value of the work and the huge impact that it brought, the importance yeah. of valuing women? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, in these, in these movements, you know, it's interesting because what what happened, what was happening in the US was happening all over the world. Other countries were looking for gender equality in their constitutions, in their lawmaking bodies. It wasn't just here and it wasn't just Europe. It was the Mideast, it was this um, Southern hemisphere. Many, many people were yearning for um, equality that's guaranteed by a constitution or laws and they recognize the inequalities it wasn't just us so and then what happens is these great movements when the goal is achieved or when you're defeated there's a falling away of enthusiasm and that may have happened for the caucus for a while because but i think that the caucus women immediately went back to working on issues like getting more women elected. That's what the caucus was formed to do. And they've been very successful incrementally over time. So yeah, I think probably Betty and, and Bella and Betty and Bella probably would have been quite discouraged after we were defeated and they would have gone on being noisy and fighting but they would have been very discouraged because the conservative movement had definitely made it very difficult to keep talking about the era and but and equality in workplace and health care and a million other things but little by little you see if they if they probably didn't live to live to see the progress that has been made, and they would come to know that. Uh, Gloria did, and she continued to work for women's issues while she was writing and living her quieter life. So she saw the progress, and 
everyone with the drive to do something wants more. Of course, we're certainly far from there. There's lots to do. And that's sort of exciting. And I love it, Larcy, that you say you're going to be committed. That yes. just yes. makes me smile. And this is recorded, so it's proof. It's on tape. <laughs> yeah. Phyllis had made her niche in the party, even though she really loved bombers and jets, jet fighter planes. She continued to talk about politics, the Republican Party, and being against women's issues, being a far right Republican for reasons of conviction or opportunity. She died um, four, four years ago, I think 2016. So she endorsed our sitting president shortly before she died. And so she was still very much an activist, Republican, part of the far conservative wing of the party. But I think the women who helped found the National Women's Political Caucus, were they here now, would be smiling at the progress and feeling their adrenaline rise at the challenge in front of them. Awesome. Well, you know what? Let's make sure that those smiles continue on. And I know for a fact that there's plenty of women in our organization, in our community, that, that wants to make sure those are permanent smiles. Um, I'm committed to it. I know the rest of us are. Um, you know, this, this was a really good dialogue and a really good discussion. Uh, Jill, just thank you so much. Mary, thank you so much. Um, the planning of this was, you know, super short notice. However, we pulled it off, got some great insight onto some backstories with the show. Um, and, you know, thank you to the viewers and for those that submitted their questions. I hope everything got answered to your liking. Um, but this is not the last. This is just the first of two. The next discussion we're going to have is on May 16th. And you can go back to the Zoom invite um, that was sent to you or David's email um, that you can click to that we, we can have access to this next discussion. Um, and I look forward to that and I look forward to learning about this more. I look forward to getting to you, or getting to know you more, Jill, and really getting some, some mental notes about how to continue on the baton and how I can pass this on to my daughter when she's ready to, to jump into the fight and there, yes, the, the rest of the young girls out there who are eager and are ready to do something. They just needed to have a way in. Um, thank you for being, Mary, thank you for being a, you know, a really strong advocate for the work that we're doing and a foundational uh, person in the common purpose um, effort into this type of work. Um, I look forward to the rest of these discussions. I want everyone to have a wonderful rainy Saturday, stay well, wash hands, um, and we look forward to chatting with you next time on May 16th. I think that's it. Any last words, Jill or Mary? Yeah, no, thank you, Marcy. It's been a pleasure, Larcy. Thank you very much. Yeah, wonderful. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye.